married. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember where you were and what you were doing on December 7, 1941. Look at all those heads nodding. Put up, oh, look at the hands. Look at the hands. All right. You have to stand up and tell your name and speak up and tell us the answer to that question. I'm Dr. Sidney Copel. Um, I was home and we were listening to the radio and uh, they just interrupted the program and uh, someone said, Japanese planes have attacked Pearl Harbor. And my parents turned around. They didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. They asked me, and I said, that's in the Hawaiian Islands. That's where it was. And we all expected it to be over in about two or three months. They said, of course, one of our Marines could really kick ass with one of those jabs. I mean, they all this big and cross-eyed. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, this gentleman here, if you'll stand up. Yes, I remember. It was a Sunday morning. I remember that. I was you in need the... need to tell us your name. Oh, I'm sorry, Sid Lieberman. Uh, it was a, um, a cloudy day. It wasn't a nice day. It was a winter day, I remember. And when they announced it, when they announced it, a lot of us didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. We thought it was the name of a girl or something. <laughs> but uh, I remember I remember the next day more than, this, than when the president spoke to us. I remember that more. And uh, we declared war on uh, Japan, and then Germany declared war on us. We never declared war on Germany. They declared war on us. There you go. Who else? Yeah. Tell us your name. My name is Don Abrams. I was, uh, on December 7th, 1941, I was the doorman at the Felton Theater in Rising Sun Avenue, down right below uh, the boulevard and I remember uh, we didn't there's no radios allowed so I had to wait well, I, didn't, I didn't know anything was out until the early edition of the record of the inquiry came out and they were a big <coughs> headline you know Pearl Harbor bombed and what so that was my recollection uh, I, I, uh, my name is Irvin Konevsky I uh, was about 16 at the time and we were having like a club meeting. We had a neighborhood club, young kids. And when the news came over, we realized what it was. And we, we knew that the war was coming and that some of us would have to get in there after a while. And we all wondered what the future was to bring us. Anyone else? Over here. My name is Lillian Abley. And we had already been at war for three years since September the 3rd, 1939. So when America came in, we said, thank you, God. Which country, you forgot to tell us which country you had already been in war with. Uh, England was at war with England. Germany. Okay, England was at war. Anyone else? Isn't this amazing? I, when I tell my story across the country and ask this question, I will have people raising their hands and giving the most meticulous details as we have this evening of something that happened nearly 70 years ago. Think of it. Nearly 70 years ago. And yet remembering, I've had a lady say I was down on the floor in the kitchen, scrubbing the kitchen floor when the radio came on on that Sunday morning and then telling what it was. I've said I had people say I was in... Yankee Stadium or some kind of stadium listening and then the, the public address system announced that anyone in the military had to go immediately to their base. We have those memories absolutely emblazoned into our, our souls. Now if you're a little bit, little bit uh, on into the times, I guess we probably still remember where we were when we heard that John Kennedy was shot. Would that be about right? And the younger generation tell me it's where they were when they heard that the Challenger exploded. You know, these things that you're never ever going to forget. Well, I was a child in China. I and my siblings were born in China. The, the children of missionaries to China. 
and we were in uh, the uh, boarding school for the children to educate the children of missionaries in Shandong province, a northeastern province of China, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. And we awakened the day after Pearl Harbor was attacked to discover Japanese soldiers on the doorstep of our school. Now let me put this in perspective a little bit. The story I'm going to tell you is about me, my brothers, and my sister, and a whole school full of the children of Christian missionaries and their teachers being marched into a Japanese concentration camp. We would not see our parents for five and a half years. Now just put this in the picture, five and a half years. And this is the story. My parents were in the far northwest of China. They had left us at the school for the children of missionaries to get an English language type of education and had returned to their missionary work in the far northwest of China. Now keep in mind, in the 1930s and, and, and the, the early 1940s, China was a very primitive nation. So that you did, could not just get on an airplane or get on a train or on a boat and be in a day or two back in your family. It didn't happen that way. There simply was not transportation that would make that possible. So we were separated now by warring armies because you may remember your world history that Japan had attacked China is at an incident in Manchuria in the early 1930s. It was just about the time that I was born and started a war that was aimed to make Asia for the Asians. And they started gobbling up chunks of China. So war had been going on between Japan and China for a long time. Well, we awaken now to find Japanese soldiers on the doorstep of our school. They brought a Shinto priest, a religious uh, priest from Japan, to the ball field who conducted a ceremony that said, this school now belonged to the great emperor of Japan. And then they brought paper seals with Japanese writing. And they pasted it to the chairs, and the desks, and the pianos, and the beds, any equipment. It now belonged to the great emperor of Japan. And then they put armbands on us so that we had the seals, that we now belong to the great emperor of Japan. We were never tattooed with prisoner numbers as prisoners were in Europe in the concentration camps. At first we just had to wear an armband, a white armband with a nationality letter. A for American, B for British. If you were an American child, you had the A. If you were British, you were Scandinavian. If you were British, you had the B. The American children, when grown-ups were not watching, turned their capital A's upside down and chalked out the crossbar and made a V for victory. Well, it wasn't very long. The Japanese let us stay pretty much on our own school campus for a few months. And then they said this beautiful school, which was right on the ocean, would make a wonderful Japanese naval base. And that was when they marched us off to concentration camp. I was about nine years old when they marched us off to concentration camp. And we ended up in a concentration camp called Weixian in northeastern uh, China. Many of you, all of you know the name Pearl Buck. You probably know that Pearl Buck herself from not so far from these parts here, was she not? Uh, eventually lived in, in, the, in these areas. Uh, Pearl Buck herself had been the, the, the daughter of Presbyterian missionaries and had lived at one time on this Presbyterian missionary compound that now had become a Japanese concentration camp. They had taken over this Presbyterian compound that had been a school and a hospital and had put, down, put built up guard towers, electrified wires, uh, booby traps and trenches on the outside, and turned it into a concentration camp. 1,500 prisoners crammed into the space of about two football fields. That was the Weixian concentration camp. The story I'm going to tell you is a story of remarkable faith, a story of remarkable fortitude I want to speak of our teachers because I was a child, nine years old, and the day the Americans came to liberate us, I was 12. A story of a whole school full of children 
separated by hundreds and hundreds of miles, warring armies in between us and with our parents, no ways to, we could get together during a period of a bloody war, and this is my story. The teachers who were Christian missionary teachers who were committed to teaching the children of missionaries, they were committed that they were going to keep school going on. They said, school will go on, and you'd shake your head. you say, school go on? How can you have school in a concentration camp? Where are the chairs? Where are the desks? Where are the books? I can assure you, you don't carry books and chairs and, and uh, desks into a concentration camp. You carry the most important necessities. Well, the teachers had this message. We will win this war, and when we do, you will have to compete with other boys and girls who have been going to school, so school will go on. Even if it meant sitting under trees, out on the ground, if it meant sitting on steamer trunks, we slept on our steamer trunks, three steamer trunks together, even if it meant sitting on steamer trunks in, in a barracks or a dormitory, you were going to have school. And you were going to have all the subjects, from Bible to math to spelling to literature to French to Latin, all those things we were going to be having because they said, we will have school that goes on. Now listen to this one. And you will have scouts and brownies and, and cub scouts in this concentration camp. Well, believe it or not, they said, we will try to make it as normal a place as we possibly can. Now think of this for a minute. Let me show you the contrast. Here we are with guard towers, walls with electrified wire, booby traps and trenches beyond, bayonet drills with guards practicing killing each other with bayonets, um, the, the guard dogs, roll calls, prisoner numbers, hunger, crowding, and the teachers are going to have Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, Brownies, Cub Scouts, yes, doing a good deed every day, yes. Believe it or not, when roll call dragged on and on and on two times a day and the guards never got around quickly to get to your unit of the camp to count everybody, what were you doing? You were practicing your semaphore and your, your, your um, Morse code for your various badges for Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. An absolutely astonishing thing. And you're going to learn the promises of God from the Bible because that's who's going to take care of us. Well, I should tell you right off the bat that our parents were great believers in anchoring their family, their children, by memorizing whole passages of the Bible. And one of their favorite was Psalm 91, which has that beautiful verse in it, and God shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. You know what the old-fashioned gramophone where the needle stuck in the track and just went on and on? And he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Remember that. That story will come up later. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In fact, when the Japanese marched us into the concentration camp, up at the head of the long snaking line of children and missionaries and retired missionaries and teachers, being marched to concentration camp, the headmaster of our school is leading the whole snaking line of us singing from Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, therefore we will not be afraid. Now, our teachers didn't just carry on the school business. Our teachers, I don't know, I don't think there's any class in any school or university that I know of any place that teaches you how to deal with kids in a concentration camp. I never heard of that. I don't know how our teachers knew this, but you know what they did? They knew if you want to make a child feel safe, whether it be at school or in your own family or in a concentration camp, you will set up a world of comfortingly predictable structure. 
you're going to make it the same way every day. So the little voice on the inside of the child says, oh, I know what's going to happen next. I feel safe. Goodness knows a lot of our families need this lesson today, don't they? Don't our schools need this lesson? Structure, structure, structure. Our teachers set it up. We're going to do it the same way every day. Miss Stark or Miss Lucia coming in. Up, 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 every day, every day, every day into the barracks room saying you're going to get up. And you're going to clean and scrub the place around your steamer trunks that you sleep on. And that you're going to wash and scrub. And then there was inspection every day. Bless my soul. You're in a concentration camp where you're hungry and crowded and you don't have washing machines and you are going to be inspected. Were you clean? Were you neat? Did you have your mending done? And if you had a rip in your pants or your dress or a hole in your sock, there was session in the afternoon where you sewed it up because you could not give up to being afraid and giving up in your spirit. You would be clean and neat and tidy because that's who you were. And the message was, you might be a prisoner on the outside, but you are not a prisoner on the inside. And then that led over to manners. Good manners in a concentration camp. They would have us march in a nice orderly line to the mess hall where you would be sitting on a, a wooden bench at a wooden table Crowds of people, there were about three mess halls in the concentration camp for 1,500 prisoners, and you might be eating boiled animal grain out of a soap dish or a tin, empty tin can. You be sure don't bring in china and, and silverware into a concentration camp. And here comes our teacher up behind us and say, Mary Taylor, which was my name, Mary Taylor, Sit your back up straight. Do not slouch over your food while you're eating it. There are not two sets of manners. One set of manners for the princesses in Buckingham Palace in England, and another set of manners for the Weishian concentration camp. There's one set of manners. So we were to have nice manners, like Princess Elizabeth, who, by the way, is now the Queen of England, and her sister, Margaret Rose, we were to have nice manners in a concentration camp. But do you know how right our teachers were? Because the structure and the predictable world where they were going to make it the best they could, the same every day with certain rules, they would not let those rules down. They were, they were probably stricter on us than the Japanese were. So school went on even though we didn't have much paper. We certainly had very few books, and there was very little that would look like a real school. And yet, can I tell you this? When I came to the United States, I was placed into grades higher than most of the students. In fact, I graduated from high school at the age of 16. Having been through concentration school with those teachers, now, food was a serious problem. It wasn't just that you didn't have decent things to eat with, like decent china or silverware. It was what you were eating. Well, there were some people that thought they had a sense of humor, and they made some kind of menu board that so they put up in the mess hall, and they put up, make it look like you were eating something fancy. Of course, in those days, people didn't really have restaurants, but it was like you put up a menu board, let people know what it was they were eating. So someone would come and put down S-O-S. Now, no, no, guys, no, 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 no. Get those smiles right off your faces. No, no, you know those teachers would never let us say such a thing. S-O-S. -S. Our Christian teachers told us what that meant. That means same old stew. Well, a little of this, a little of that, a little of something else, and the, the cooks who were prisoners in the camp would just glop it all together in giant cauldrons and cook it up, and then if there was anything left, add water, and then it became soup. Or it might be TT soup, which was turnip top soup, the leaves of turnip tops. 
with what we were eating. Or for breakfast, you might be eating boiled animal grain. Well, the doctors who were prisoners in the camp became extremely concerned for the long-term health effects of children without having adequate food. And so the doctor said, if any of you are black marketing over the wall, and you did risk your life to do that, or you risked the life of the Chinese farmers who were swapping stuff over the wall in areas where the Japanese might not be guarding at some particular moment. And the doctor said, if there are those of you who are black marketing eggs over the wall, when you finish eating the eggs, save the eggshells for the children. Wash the eggshells, bake them, then grind them into powder, and put the eggshell powder onto the children's tongues. And I remember vividly when we would be leaving the barracks in the morning to go out to our activities in the concentration camp, there we would stand. This is when there were eggshells. And we would be spooned, a spoonful of eggshells on our tongue because the doctor said this was pure calcium. Good for our bones and good for our teeth. They said there were girls getting into their teens without having a menstrual period because of poor nutrition, no milk, very inadequate fresh vegetables and anything of that kind. And so this, this was what part of, the, part of the routine that the big people in the camp were doing to try to save the lives of the children who were there. Now picture this, about 1,500, 1500 people in this camp, and there were large numbers of children. Above and beyond our school, we were children without our parents. But there were many, many people, the whole families that were interned, that had their parents and their children together. But very, very poor nutrition. By the way, when I tell this story to school children, let me say what I say to them. I say, children, can you imagine what it would be like to live day and night with your school teachers for five and a half years? Well, the children go, ew, and hold their eyes and cover their ears. <clears throat> And then I pause and I say to the teachers, <laughs> teachers, can you imagine having to be with your students day and night for five and a half years? Well, the teachers are much politer than the children, but let me tell you, I can read their faces. Well, they, the teachers were not the only heroes in this place. One of the heroes in this concentration camp was a very, very famous person called Eric Little. Some of you may have seen the movie Chariots of Fire that won, I don't know how many um, Academy Awards, more than 20 years ago, I think now. Eric Little was the Olympic athlete from England, from Scotland, who won uh, a gold medal in the 1924 Olympics at Paris. He would not run on Sunday, so switched from one race that he was expected to win to one that he wasn't quite as adept in, but won the gold medal. Eric Little became a missionary to China. Actually, he had been born in China. His own parents were missionaries. And Eric Little, when he became a missionary to China, the Japanese were rounding people up and putting them in, uh, getting ready to put them in concentration camps. Eric Little was brought to the Weixian concentration camp. We children called him Uncle Eric. He had anticipated there was trouble coming and had shipped his wife and children to Canada before the roundup came, so he was there without his wife and children. He was a saint if ever there was a saint. A, a devout, God-fearing man whose favorite preaching was from the Sermon on the Mount. Can you imagine in a concentration camp with Japanese guards around, with guard, guard dogs and bayonet drills, teaching from Jesus' words, love your enemies. And when the kids said, well, Uncle Eric, that probably is just sort of a, something to reach for. And he said, no, because look what the next verse says. Pray for the people that despitefully use you and persecute you. And he says it means you're supposed to love the Japanese. Well, Uncle Eric 
would lead various games and coordinate games and activities for the children, races and all kinds. If you had any kind of broken equipment, there was very little equipment of any kind, Uncle Eric would fix it. I don't think there was anybody that was more admired in the Weishan concentration camp than Uncle Eric, and he died in that camp. Uh, not from abuse, but from a brain tumor. He never saw his wife and children again. He was certainly one of the, one of the heroes of Weishan. Another set of heroes was the Salvation Army Band. Now, the Salvation Army Band was rounded up like everybody else. They were missionaries in China. In the Beijing.